In late 1986, Kurt met his first real girlfriend. She played a huge role in his life, helping him grow from a troubled teenager into an adult. She supported him emotionally, financially, and musically. So in a way, you were the, the patron of Nirvana. Sort of, yeah, I guess you could say. I mean, I, I don't want to say that for sure, but yeah, in a way, of Kurt anyway. She even inspired the song about a girl. Today, she still keeps many of Kurt's artworks and paintings in her home. So who is Tracy Miranda? How did she and Kurt meet? And how did she help shape the Nirvana we know today? Let's find out. Tracy Diane Miranda was born on April 27, 1965. She dated Kurt Cobain from 1985 to 1988. Tracy was Kurt's first serious girlfriend when he was around 20, and she was just a year older. Tracy was an attractive woman with dark brown hair, huge eyes, and a tan complexion. According to Michael Azarad, she wasn't like any of the other girls Kurt knew. She had a zebra-striped coat, and her hair was dyed fire engine red, and she lived in Olympia. Tracy liked to party and had her share of eccentricities, but she was also a placid, nurturing soul. During this time, Kurt was juggling his job at the Polynesian Resort with his music gigs. He often traveled to Olympia, where he bonded with Tracy. Their story goes back to 1985, in front of the Gorilla Gardens, a barn-like punk club in Seattle's Chinatown. We met at a party and, you know, I liked him and I had a crush on him. And then finally, someone told him, don't you get that she likes you or something? Because he was just kind of clueless about it, you know? I liked that he was funny, he made me laugh. He wasn't afraid to be, you know, goofy or silly. Their paths crossed again a year later at Buzz Osborne's parents' place watching Buzz and Chris drink Mad Dog. After Kurt left, Buzz informed her that Kurt was the guy who made the really cool kiss mural on the side of the Melvin's tour van, known as the Melvan, using magic markers. Every time a pen ran out, he'd go into the shop right in Montesano and steal another one. And she thought that was kind of cool. Well, that was his personality. He was, he was, he could be very funny. He would tell jokes and, and play jokes and, and, on people. He uh, liked a lot of the same kind of music that I did. He liked a lot of this, doing the same sort of things, and he was very artistic too. He could draw really well. Uh, you know, he played guitar, but th that that didn't matter to me so much at the time. I actually liked the fact that he could draw and stuff, and it was funny more than that. Tracy said that she had been flirting with him for quite a while, and their relationship became solid in early 1987. Kurt admired Tracy's love for animals and her deep knowledge of music. Eventually, he moved in with Tracy in her apartment in Olympia, away from Aberdeen where he had lived for 20 years. Life in the studio apartment in Olympia was anything but ordinary. The place was home to five cats, four rats, a cockatiel, two rabbits, and Kurt's turtles. It's very important to note that Tracy played a key role during a crucial time in Kurt's life and the birth of Nirvana. I like to think he was happy. We we're very much in love with each other. And uh, I said I just tried to support him because he wanted to be a musician, he wanted to, you know, get his band going. He was ambitious. He didn't want to just be play in a bar band, you know, and play music that way. He wanted to be a success. She was there for Nirvana's very first concert in Raymond, which had just 15 people in the audience, and she was always there to support Kurt's artistic dreams. Her support let him dive deep into songwriting, band rehearsals, and visual art, setting the stage for his success while she's the one to take care of the bills. She had a graveyard shift in the cafeteria at the Boeing airplane plant in Seattle. She'd head to work at 10 in the evening and wouldn't be back until 9 in the morning. Hello? No, she's not. She went to work. With her unconventional hours, Tracy started leaving to-do lists for Kurt, which turned into a special way they communicated. She was more than a girlfriend to Kurt. She was also a friend and sometimes even a mother figure. Kurt often told his friends he had the best girlfriend in the world. Do you think you mothered him quite a lot? Probably, yeah. Without really meaning to, but yes. I mean, do you think he kind of looked for a, a mother in a way? Um, I think a little bit. At home, their life was calm and peaceful, free from violence. Since moving out of the shack in Aberdeen and during those early days with Tracy, Kurt drank and used drugs much less. Nirvana played a few parties in early 1987, 
and even performed on the college radio station Chaos in Olympia. Tracy Miranda gave a tape of the radio show to Jim May at Tacoma's Community World Theater, CWT, and urged him to book Nirvana. Tracy Miranda and Shelley, Christ's girlfriend, now his wife, played invaluable roles in the band during those early days. They acted as informal press agents, managers, bookers, and merch salespeople. Plus, they made sure their guys were well-fed, dressed, and ready to rehearse. Since Tracy and Shelley worked at the same place and could support Nirvana financially, the band started accepting free gigs. Paid venues were rare, and this strategy helped them slowly build a loyal fan base by playing anywhere they could. Nirvana's debut studio album, Bleach, was released on June 15, 1989, through Sub Pop. The album cover featured a photograph taken by Kurt Cobain's girlfriend, Tracy Miranda, during a concert at the Rico Muse Art Gallery in Olympia, Washington. The photo was printed in reverse negative, perfectly capturing the band's vibe at the time, a mix of dark songs and pop tunes. Tracy complained that despite Kurt writing dozens of songs during their three years together, none were about her. Instead, Kurt wrote about the most bizarre things. However, in Kurt's journal, he wrote, I would love to write a pretty song for her, even though I have no right to speak for her. And that's how About a Girl came to be. Is it true that he wrote that song, you know, about, about a girl? He said, I can't spend every night with you for free. He never told me directly that song was about me. Michael Azarad said that Kurt said that it was. It's a beautiful song, actually. I mean, I love that song. Kurt would often say, I just write what comes into my head, and I don't write about you or anyone else. When Kurt played the song for his bandmates, Chad and Chris, they liked it right away. They asked what it was called. Kurt had no idea yet. Then Chad asked, what's it about? And Kurt admitted, it's about a girl. And that's how the song got its name. In the book, Journals, released by Kurt Cobain's estate, we learned that Kurt wrote this song while his girlfriend was giving him the cold shoulder and heading off to work. The lyrics delve into the tension between Kurt and Tracy, mainly due to Kurt's reluctance to get a job or help with household chores in their pet-filled apartment. The first signs of trouble between Chris and Shelley showed up when they broke up. Kurt always felt unworthy of love, especially Tracy's, and this led to arguments between them. Tracy loved him unconditionally, but Kurt pushed her away. Even the to-do notes Tracy Miranda left around the house started getting longer because Kurt stopped helping with chores. Their apartment filled up with dolls, sculptures, paintings, collages, and animals, which began to irritate Tracy. When I met him, he was a handyman, and then he got a job as a janitor, and cleaning like you know doctor's offices and dentist's offices and things like that. But um, yeah, he just ended up not having another job after that. After Chris and Shelley's breakup. Tracy worried she and Kurt would be next. To test his commitment, she threatened to end their relationship. Kurt didn't take it well and threatened to live in his car again, something he was used to from his homeless days in Aberdeen. Is it true that you, you know, at one point, like I said, you've got to get a job, and he said he'd move in the, into his car? Yeah, and then I said, well, you don't have to live in your car, you just stay here. Meanwhile, Nirvana was growing with more frequent concerts, including their first European tour for the album Bleach. When they returned to the USA, Chris and Shelley got back together and got married. But Kurt and Tracy's relationship became shakier. Tracy felt she was losing Kurt to everyone else. With Nirvana's success, Kurt started earning more money and no longer depended on Tracy. I can't really say exactly why we broke up. I just know that we were fighting more and he was staying away from the house more. I think he just pretty much didn't love me as much as he used to. Or felt, he just felt like maybe he was moving ahead and I wasn't. During the recording sessions for the follow-up to Bleach, Kurt called Tracy and told her things weren't working out and suggested they shouldn't live together anymore. They both knew it was over. In the same week, Kurt fired Chad Channing from the band. He also ended things with Tracy. Even though they broke up, they kept living together for another three months, sharing an apartment but drifting apart emotionally. During this time, Kurt fell hard for Toby Vale, keeping the affair a secret from Tracy. They still spent some time together after the breakup, but nothing could have prepared them for the whirlwind that was Courtney Love. We'll dive deeper into that story in our next video. 
Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more.